Welcome to our channel, where we unravel the most gripping true crime stories. Today, we're diving into a case that has left a community in shock and a family in unimaginable pain, the disappearance of D. Warner. For over three years, her whereabouts were a mystery, but recent developments have brought some disturbing answers. This is the story of D. Warner, a tale of love, betrayal, and a relentless quest for justice. It was a quiet morning on April 25, 2021, when Dee Warner was last seen alive. She lived in Franklin Township, Michigan, with her husband, Dale Warner, in what appeared to be a normal suburban life. But behind closed doors, the truth was far darker. Dee's marriage to Dale was anything but idyllic. Her family described their relationship as toxic, marred by control and fear. Dale was reportedly possessive and abusive, leaving Dee in a constant state of anxiety. On that fateful morning, Dee vanished without a trace. Her phone went silent, her bank accounts untouched, and her social media dormant. For her family, this was the beginning of a nightmare. They immediately suspected foul play, and their fears were compounded when Dale showed little concern for her disappearance. He was uncooperative with police, raising suspicions further. It was as if Dee had simply disappeared off the face of the earth, but her family knew something more sinister was at play. The initial investigation into Dee's disappearance was fraught with challenges. The local authorities, led by a controversial officer, were criticized for not pursuing the case with the urgency it required. Dee's family was left frustrated, feeling that the investigation was stalling. They couldn't understand why more wasn't being done, especially given the clear signs that something was amiss. Despite their pleas, the case remained stagnant for over two years. The pain of not knowing what happened to Dee was unbearable for her family. They continued to push for answers, keeping her story alive in the media and urging the community to stay vigilant. But as time passed, hope began to fade, and the case risked becoming another unsolved mystery. Everything changed in August 2023 when the Michigan State Police took over the investigation. With fresh eyes and a new approach, they began to re-examine the evidence, including Dale Warner's behavior and the unexplained circumstances surrounding Dee's disappearance. It was during this renewed investigation that a search warrant was executed on Dale's property in November 2023. What they found was chilling, evidence that pointed to Dale's involvement in Dee's disappearance. He was arrested and charged with open murder and tampering with evidence, but there was still one crucial piece missing, Dee's body. In August 2024, investigators conducted another search of Dale Warner's property, and this time, they made a grim discovery. Human remains were found in a sealed tank intended for anhydrous ammonia, a substance used as fertilizer. While the remains have yet to be positively identified, they are believed to be those of D. Warner. This discovery has finally provided the physical evidence that had eluded investigators for so long, but it has also confirmed the family's worst fears. The discovery of Dee's remains is a critical turning point in the case, but it also raises new questions. How did this happen? What drove Dale to such lengths? And most importantly, will justice be served? Dale Warner remains behind bars, maintaining his innocence as he awaits his trial. His defense team argues that the evidence is circumstantial and insufficient to convict him. But with the discovery of the remains, the case against him has never been stronger. The upcoming trial, scheduled for September 4, 2024, is expected to be a landmark case, not just for Dee's family but for the broader issue of how domestic violence cases are handled by the justice system. For Dee's family, the discovery of her remains brings a bittersweet sense of closure. They have spent years fighting for answers, and while the outcome is tragic, they are one step closer to justice. The case of Dee Warner is a reminder of the hidden dangers that can exist behind closed doors and the importance of never giving up on the search for truth. The story of Dee Warner is a heartbreaking example of a life taken too soon, of a woman trapped in a dangerous situation with no way out. But it is also a story of resilience, of a family that refused to give up, and of a community that came together in the pursuit of justice. As the trial approaches, we can only hope that justice will be served, 
and D. Warner's story will serve as a powerful reminder of the importance of speaking out against abuse. If this story moved you, please like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth true crime stories. Your support helps us continue to bring these important cases to light. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Stay tuned for updates on this case and others like it. Hit the notification bell to be alerted when we upload new content. We appreciate your support in helping to bring justice and awareness to cases like D. Warner's. We want to thank you for keeping it here at Playful Parade. We certainly do appreciate your support. Now, in a shocking and emotional revelation, pop star Bibi Rexa has claimed that she was threatened by a Lufthansa airline worker, and she believes the incident was fueled by discrimination against her Albanian heritage. The Grammy-nominated singer, who was born in the United States to Albanian parents, took to her Instagram story on Saturday to share her distressing experience. Through tearful posts, Rexa recounted the troubling encounter, stating that she approached a security agent at the airport, whom she believed to be Albanian, and spoke to him in Albanian, asking for directions to get her ticket. To her shock, Rexa alleges that the interaction quickly escalated, with the agent allegedly banning her from the flight and continuing to mentally abuse her. I believe this to be a hate crime because I am Albanian, Rexa wrote, her frustration and hurt palpable through her words. She further expressed her disappointment with the situation, noting that none of the female Lufthansa staff members present stepped in to assist her or address the issue. The singer, who has always been proud of her Albanian roots, described the incident as one of the most emotionally draining experiences of her life. Despite the airline's attempt to reach out to her directly, Rexa has called for a full investigation into what she perceives as a blatant act of discrimination. In response to the allegations, a Lufthansa spokesperson provided a statement to Playful Parade, acknowledging the gravity of the situation and confirming that they had directly contacted Rexa to better understand the events that transpired. We are conducting an internal review on the matter, the spokesperson stated, emphasizing the airline's commitment to connecting people and countries around the world. We do not tolerate any discriminatory behavior of any kind, they added. Despite the harrowing experience, Rexa was able to board her flight on time, according to Lufthansa. However, the incident has sparked a broader conversation about discrimination and the experiences of individuals with diverse backgrounds, particularly within the travel industry. Rexa's rise to fame began with her country pop hit, Meant to Be, in 2017, and she has since become a household name with chart-topping singles like Me, Myself and I, In the Name of Love, and the 2022 UK official singles chart-topper, I'm Good, Blue. Throughout her career, she has been an outspoken advocate for her Albanian heritage, often sharing her cultural pride with her millions of fans. The incident with Lufthansa has resonated with many, particularly within the Albanian community, who see Rexa not just as a music icon but as a representative of their culture on the global stage. The singer's candid and emotional account of the situation has sparked outrage and a call for accountability, with fans and supporters flooding social media with messages of solidarity and demands for justice. As Lufthansa continues its internal review, the incident serves as a stark reminder of the challenges that individuals from diverse backgrounds can face, even in seemingly routine situations. B.B. Rex's experience underscores the importance of addressing and combating discrimination in all its forms, ensuring that no one is subjected to such treatment based on their ethnicity or heritage. As the story continues to unfold, all eyes will be on Lufthansa to see how they handle the situation and whether they take meaningful steps to prevent such incidents from occurring in the future. For B.B. Rexa, this ordeal has undoubtedly been a painful one, but her decision to speak out serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of standing up against injustice, no matter where it occurs. <laughs> the supervisor on the plant, Lufthansa, is threatening me. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're threatening me. I'm not going to get up. Please. In a significant legal development, New Zealand has taken the final step toward extraditing internet mogul Kim.com to the United States, marking the culmination of a protracted legal battle that has captivated the world for over a decade. The decision, made by New Zealand's Justice Minister Paul Goldsmith, was announced on Thursday, setting the stage for .com's potential deportation to face serious charges in the U.S. related to his now-defunct file-sharing website, Megaplode. .com, a German-born entrepreneur with New Zealand residency, 
has been embroiled in a fierce legal struggle since 2012, when the U.S. government shut down Megaplode and sought his extradition. The charges against him are grave. Conspiracy to commit racketeering, wire fraud, conspiracy to infringe copyright on a commercial scale, and money laundering. These allegations stem from accusations that Dotcom and his co-defendants, who were also indicted by a U.S. grand jury, profited massively from widespread copyright infringement facilitated by Megaplode. The site, which became wildly popular for its ability to quickly and easily store and share large files, was used by millions worldwide. However, U.S. authorities contend that Dotcom and his associates were fully aware that their platform was being used for illegal file sharing on a massive scale and that they actively profited from this activity. Dotcom, however, has consistently denied these allegations, maintaining that Megaplode was merely a tool for file sharing and that he cannot be held responsible for the actions of its users. Justice Minister Goldsmith, in a statement, emphasized that he had carefully considered all relevant information before deciding to sign the extradition order. I considered all of the information carefully and have decided that Mr. Dotcom should be surrendered to the U.S. to face trial, Goldsmith said. He added that Dotcom would be given a brief period to seek advice on this decision before any further comments would be made. Despite the legal setback, Dotcom remains defiant. Taking to X, formerly known as Twitter, Dotcom declared, I love New Zealand. I'm not leaving. His statement reflects the fierce loyalty he feels toward the country that has been his home and his determination to continue his fight against extradition. Dotcom's arrest in 2012 was nothing short of cinematic. New Zealand police, acting on behalf of U.S. authorities, descended on his opulent Auckland mansion in a dramatic raid that involved two helicopters and a forced entry into a locked safe room where Dotcom was hiding. The raid and subsequent legal proceedings have sparked intense debate and international attention, particularly concerning the implications of extraditing a resident of one country to face charges in another under U.S. law. The battle over Dotcom's extradition has made its way through several New Zealand courts, all of which have ruled against him and his co-defendants. Their defense centered on the argument that Megaplode was simply a platform, akin to other file-sharing sites, and that they should not be held accountable for the actions of its users. Moreover, they argued that the charges of profiting from copyright infringement should not be grounds for extradition since copyright infringement is not a criminal offense in New Zealand. However, the courts dismissed these arguments, siding with the U.S. and ultimately leaving the final decision in the hands of the justice minister. Now, with Goldsmith's decision, Dotcom faces the very real possibility of being sent to the U.S. to stand trial, a prospect that could result in significant prison time if he is convicted. The case has broader implications especially considering the ongoing debate over U.S. copyright laws, which are often criticized for being overly favorable to copyright holders at the expense of innovation and consumer rights. Critics argue that these laws, which have been exported globally through various trade agreements, stifle technological advancement and impose American legal standards on other countries. As Dotcom's legal team gears up for what could be one of their final battles in this long-running saga, the world watches closely. The outcome could not only determine Dotcom's fate, but also set a precedent for how digital entrepreneurs and innovators are treated in an increasingly interconnected and legally complex world. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris indirectly criticized former President Donald Trump on Sunday, suggesting her opponent in the November 5 election was a coward whose politics focused on putting down rivals. The remarks came in a campaign appearance in the critical battleground state of Pennsylvania with running mate Minnesota Governor Tim Walls before Harris heads to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which kicks off Monday. Over the last several years there's been this kind of perversion that has taken place, I think, which is to suggest that the measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down. When what we know is the real and true measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up, Harris told a crowd of supporters. Anybody who's about beating down other people is a coward. She did not directly name Trump who in a campaign appearance Saturday in eastern Pennsylvania referred to Harris as a radical and a lunatic. Opinion polls have shown Harris bringing fresh energy to the campaign and closing the gap with former President Trump both nationally and in many of the eight highly competitive states, including Pennsylvania, that will play a decisive role in picking Democratic President Joe Biden's successor. Harris, who is black and has Asian heritage, will be the first woman president if she wins in November. She said that she was nearly done writing the speech she will deliver when she accepts the Democratic presidential nomination on Thursday. There will be a lot that is about what I believe is a way forward, a new way forward, and bringing everyone along in that, 
she told reporters outside a restaurant. Trump on Saturday said he believed she would be easier to beat than Biden, 81, who dropped out last month under pressure from his own party after a disastrous debate against Trump. Pennsylvania was one of three Rust Belt states, along with Wisconsin and Michigan, that helped power Republican Trump's upset victory in the 2016 election. Biden, who grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, flipped the trio back to the Democrats in 2020, and Harris aims to hold on to them. Sources said on Saturday that she is likely to join Biden on stage at the convention on Monday as he passes the torch to her as the party's nominee for president. The Trump campaign will try to counter-program the convention with a series of swing state events this week. He will visit a manufacturing facility in York, Pennsylvania, on Monday, where his campaign says he will focus on the economy, and a county sheriff's office in Howell, Michigan, on Tuesday to talk about safety and crime. Trump and his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, will travel to Asheboro, North Carolina, on Wednesday for remarks on national security, and on Friday Trump will join Turning Point Action, a group founded by conservative activist Charlie Kirk, for a rally in Glendale, Arizona, aimed in part at highlighting efforts to boost turnout. Trump supporters said they hope he will refocus his campaign on policy rather than the repeated personal attacks against Harris he has leaned heavily on in the weeks since she emerged as the Democratic candidate. President Trump can win this election. His policies are good for America and if you have a policy debate he wins. Donald Trump the provocateur, the showman, may not win this election, Republican U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham said on NBC's Meet the Press on Sunday. Policy is the key to the White House. To Dima Adichina, who quit the Miss South Africa beauty pageant last week after being embroiled in a row over her nationality, has accepted an invitation to compete for the title of Miss Universe Nigeria instead. Born to a Nigerian father and a South African mother with Mozambican roots, Adichina, 23, withdrew from the South African contest as questions swirled over her eligibility to enter and she became the target of xenophobic online attacks. Posting on Instagram on August 8, she said she made the difficult decision to quit the contest to protect the safety and well-being of my family and I. A day after Adichina announced her withdrawal from the Miss South Africa pageant, the organizers of Miss Universe Nigeria invited her to compete in their contest instead, saying it was an opportunity to represent her father's native land on an international stage, and adding that her journey in the world of pageantry is far from over. Responding to the invitation, Adichina said in a video shared on Instagram Thursday that she was excited to embark on this journey, describing Miss Universe Nigeria as Africa's most prestigious beauty pageant. When Adichina was selected for the Miss South Africa pageant last month, her Nigerian names triggered calls for clarity on her citizenship status from some South Africans and made her the subject of xenophobic attacks on social media. In a statement posted on its website on August 7, South Africa's Home Affairs Department, which oversees immigration, said it investigated Adichina's citizenship at the request of the pageant's organizers and found that fraud and identity theft may have been committed by her mother to obtain South African citizenship. However, it added that Adichina could not have participated in the alleged unlawful actions of her mother, as she was an infant at the time when the activities took place in 2001. The department said it was working to establish the full set of facts on the matter and was also obtaining legal advice on the implications of the alleged fraudulent activity on Adichina's citizenship status. Playful Parade has reached out to Adichina for comment. Miss South Africa's organizers acknowledged Adichina's withdrawal from the contest, wishing her the very best and success in all her endeavors. They added in a statement that the pageant celebrates South Africa's rich and inclusive culture and diversity. The nationality spat has elicited mixed reactions in South Africa, where xenophobic and anti-immigrant attacks are common. If she, Adichina, was born here, she is South African. She is not her parents, populist opposition politician Julius Malima said in a recent interview discouraging xenophobia. Adichina's withdrawal from the Miss South Africa contest also drew sympathy from Grammy-winning singer Tyla, who said in a post on X that she was disappointed at the online harassment Adichina had faced. Tyla said that while she will always stand with South Africa, she believed that, regardless of the opinions, she, Adichina, was bullied and that's what I don't stand for. If she wins Miss Universe Nigeria, Adichina will represent the West African nation in the Miss Universe beauty pageant to be held in Mexico later this year. Oh.